Good morning, CLC. I invite you to just take a few deep breaths. As you breathe in cool, calming air, when you release that breath, release all stress and tension you may be holding in your body. Take another nice, deep breath in, breathing in life itself and breathing out all that no longer serves you. In this moment, allow your body to just relax. Center your mind and allow yourself to be here now. Universal love enfolds me. Universal wisdom inspires me. Universal spirit enlightens me. Universal power encircles me. I am one and all is well. As we begin this inner healing process, let me invite you to relax in quiet confidence, opening yourself to the miracle working higher power. Now symbolize the unity of your thinking and feeling nature by touching your chest with your hand and let my words act as your own. For your own inner healing, acceptance, and receptivity. I acknowledge that there is a power, intelligence, and wisdom greater than my own. I am in the midst of it, and it is in the midst of me, sensitive and responsive to my every thought, word, action, and feeling. I now make this true for myself by saying aloud, I acknowledge. Acknowledging this higher power working through my life, I admit that I am personally responsible for solving my own problems while being guided and assisted by something greater than myself. As I am ready to surrender the conflicts of my ego to the wisdom of this infinite presence, I simply speak these words, I surrender. Knowing that forgiveness is the key to unconditional love and the feeling of heaven, I now unconditionally forgive anyone and everyone who has ever injured me in any way, real or imagined. And I now forgive myself for all of my mistaken judgments and their resulting actions. From my deepest level of understanding, I now say, I forgive. Realizing that I continually experience the effects of my own thinking, I now choose to allow this higher power to recreate me deeply, filling my mind with thoughts that are only positive, constructive, loving, and beautiful. I call upon this divine inflow by stating aloud, I choose. I now center upon that one special idea that I'm willing to accept as real for me in this coming week. Visualizing that idea as already acted upon and brought to pass, in seeing my idea become a fact of my experience, I enjoy the happiness and peace of my thought fulfilled 
and gratefully speak these words. I accept. I accept. Knowing that I have an everlasting place in the midst of the power that sustains all creation, as well as the support of all those around me, I allow myself to relax in the peace of fulfillment and gratitude and say, I release. I release. Now, in my mind's eye, I envision the presence of someone near and dear to me. This can be a friend, a family member, a teacher or mentor, someone who has touched my life in deep and loving ways, someone who may not be physically present in the room with me this morning. I turn toward that image in my mind's eye and say, I'm grateful for the good in your life. Now I open my eyes, turn to the world around me, and joyfully speak to anyone physically present in the room or virtually on this broadcast, and share in confidence and gratitude and saying, I'm grateful for the good in your life. Good morning again. Thank you for being here, whether you are in the room or on this broadcast. Thank you for sharing this moment with us. We are so deeply grateful to have you here and have you a part of this service. We have you rock. We will rock you. Champions, right? Well, I'm emotionally exhausted today. I have to be honest with you. It's been quite a week. Um, and it started about 2 o'clock last Sunday. Um, started before then, really, because there was a run-up to it. But we had a very long and very emotional memorial for our beloved Reverend Marsha Lane. And there will be a video of this on a private YouTube channel you can request a link to later today or tomorrow or sometime early in the week. It was on Zoom. Uh, please treat for her family. Continue to treat for her family, for everybody's life she touched. And for all the people here in the room and the people online who just felt so much and were so engaged in, in even if they just had their thoughts turned this way, they weren't necessarily watching, but they were, they were aware of what was going on, this, this large community that we have. It doesn't look like a large community. Sometimes you look around the room here, but you know, Michael Levinson, new practitioner, who I would have told you all about getting licensed, except Danielle beat me too. No, I'm kidding. But he, he's representative of a large group of people who consider themselves creative life people. And you've never met them. And I've never met them. I've seen more of them than you have probably on Zoom classes and stuff. But I've not met them. But they're part of this place. And uh, so that chair next to you is, is representative of somebody who lives in another state or maybe even another country because we have a following, I know for sure, in Canada and also in Jamaica, okay? And maybe elsewhere too, because not everybody comments, you know, we don't know who all's involved in this. But anyway, it's been an emotional week. And I can't say that the emotions are going to stop anytime soon because there's always change in the air. There's always something going on to react to. Perhaps it doesn't affect you personally. Perhaps it does. So what are we going to do about all of this? Well, today I want to talk about pride as a function of the conversations about ego and divine nature and human nature, kind of a continuation of all of that and a wrap up of that series. And also because it's Pride Weekend as part of Pride Month for the LGBTQ plus community with whom we stand and always have in full support of being exactly who everyone is. And as you heard me say last week, when I, I think it was last week, they blur sometimes, but the story about the guy who 
went from place to place spiritually and he married a woman of a different faith and went to her house of worship and talked to her spiritual director and was told, God loves you just the way you are. And it blew his mind because nobody had ever told him this. Because everywhere he'd been, somebody said, God will love you better when you're free from sin. God will love you better when you follow God's laws. God, God is waiting for you to change, hoping for you to change, shedding tears when you don't change. Then he heard, God loves you just the way you are. And we sing a song, a guy who you know who attends here complained to me a couple of weeks ago. He said, we don't sing the old songs anymore. And I said, oh, calm down, calm. We'll sing the old songs. We got to get out the printer. We got to get some ink in there. We got to print the things. We gotta, we're going to sing the old songs. Because he said when he came to this place for the first time, and we were still so it's 20 plus years ago, 22 years ago, because that's how we measure life, the creative life. We have eons. We have epochs, you know, like the Paleozoic and stuff, OK? So the previous <laughs> eon of creative life was when we met upstairs before we moved into the Great Hall here. And this is when he started attending and he walked in and we were singing, I love myself the way I am. And it split him in two. As it does so many people when we sing that little song, that little ditty of a song that David Alt and Alliance wrote. And he said, I'd love to have us sing that again. So we're gonna sing that again. I bring it up because there's a line, it's I love myself the way I am and still I choose to grow. God loves you just the way you are, and still you choose to grow. But you grow in expansion of and expression of that feeling of love within yourself, not in order to earn it. Grace is not earned. In this teaching, grace is not earned, either by faith or by works. Grace is granted as a right of nature. You are a grace-filled spiritual being because, how do you know this? Because you exist. Because you exist. That's it. And everything else is an adornment on that, is a refinement of that, is an extension, is something of that. But it, it's all a variation on a theme. And the theme is that you are the beloved right now just the way you are. So why have pride, right? If you're all because pride is about taking self-possession of that awareness within yourself, to be proud of yourself the way you are, to say, I belong here. I belong in this conversation. I belong in this life. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, I do this already. You know, I've got that all taken care of. But do you? And if you don't, the person next to you might not have it all taken care of. Because we're haunted sometimes by what we've been told by the culture is wrong with us by what we've been told by the culture fails in comparison to other people or to a supposed norm up to which we're all to live. We've been told this stuff. So I'll tell you a little story. When I was a little kid, I, had a, I, was, I was born with an orthopedic condition that was in those days treated in a rather different way. My, the word primitive comes to mind, but <laughs> barbaric, uh, a, a way involving traction uh, in a way that's different than now. And so I, when I was a very little kid, when I first started to walk, I limped. I limped, and I, and I limped for a while uh, until various medical things could be done, like in the second grade. When I was in first grade, I sat there, and they said, well, he tested pretty bright to get into the school but he's not doing real well. And they realized I couldn't see the blackboard. I, I couldn't see stuff. And they stuck me somewhere in the room, you know. So they moved me up to the front. I still couldn't see it. So I, then I put glasses on me. So for a certain period of time, I'm not sure exactly how long, I was a limping bespectacled, <laughs> okay, skinny, red-haired, little kid, all right? And as a result, I took away from that experience certain defining beliefs. 
because you do. Uh, one thing you find when you're a little, a little boy, at least in the early 60s, when you're a little boy and you wear glasses, you don't get in fights much. In fact, people tend to sort of, they kind of protect you and all of this. But that, that's a whole different thing because you're, you're trying to fit in and you get the picture of this. But here's the thing is, I walk fine now. And if I didn't tell you I wear contacts, you wouldn't know. You see, I have reading glasses up here. You say, well, he's got a gray beard. He's entitled to, actually, it's white now, but you're entitled to, <laughs> you're entitled to reading glasses, you know? But there were aspects of my being that I developed fundamental beliefs around that it was some years later I realized were there, okay? About fitting in, about my machismo, about whatever that I th had then tried to overcompensate for in different ways. But I don't limp, and I can see. There are situations that we're born into that we don't change, that we develop beliefs around, that we can't just change who we are to satisfy the court of public opinion. So what we have to realize is the court of opinion does not matter. The court of opinion does not matter about who you are and about how you are. It's all about how you feel inside yourself about yourself. And are you willing? Are you willing to stand in your own truth and take self-possession of an identity? Even if you change your identity, even if you change your gender identity, to take possession of yourself as this amazing godling that you are. And still I choose to grow. And still I choose to grow. And stop the judgment of other people. Back off on the judgment of other people. You and I were not sent here to judge the world. You and I were not sent here to evaluate who gets into the next life. You and I were sent here as, if you want to use that term, as expressions of love to give and receive love as unconditionally as we possibly can. Now, being a human, you may say to yourself, well, if I do that, what's in it for me? Because I actually had somebody say, well, we don't, if we don't judge others, where's the fun in that? Because it's great sport, isn't it? And we get good at it. You can write whole books on how other people are wrong. And, and the people who want to stand with you on their wrongness will buy those books and everybody can feel right about it. You know? So it's like, what, what is in it for us with unconditional love? It sounds like a really strict diet, unconditional love. Well, I can't think this and I can't say that and I can't insult these people over here. So what do I get to do? What you get to do is thrive. What you get to do, okay? What you get to do is send tonic waves of life rather than toxic ones through your own body. You get to digest food better. You wanna get real down and dirty? There you are, okay? You get to sleep better. You have fewer nightmares. Your whole metabolism changes, less tension, less stress. Your heart rate, your breathing, your lung capacity, all of these things, I promise you, begin to moderate themselves when you live in a space of giving and receiving unconditional love with as much as possible without judgment, without judgment without condemnation. By judgment, I mean condemnation. I realize that every word I use is like opens out into a whole thing because like, don't we have to judge sometimes? Sure, we have to discern. You know, we have to discern. We evaluate. That's part of the intellectual process. I'm talking about moral condemnation. I'm talking about that form of judgment. I'm talking about the kind of judgment that applies more strongly to other people than to ourselves. The yardstick is not applied to us. If you want to judge somebody, if you have to judge somebody, if you absolutely, by God, have to judge somebody today, then let it be yourself. Then let it be yourself. And look at yourself and take stock of yourself and say, am I doing the next right thing?
do this as much as possible without condemnation. As a matter of fact, if you open a dialogue with yourself and keep it going, the condemnation kind of fades away and it becomes just an information stream back and forth. If you open the conversation with the God of your understanding and keep it open, then it's not this alien thing when it's time to pray. This is a question on kind of an unrelated subject, but people bring this up. They'll say, well, I, I haven't prayed in years, and so to go to God and ask for some things, it feels strange. Well, of course it feels strange. So what you want to do is soften up the process, just like you would with another person, okay? Like, I, I look at the people that I, that I work with here every weekend and, and have for, you know, years, and uh, we have an understanding. We're, you know, we're a team. Our practitioners are a team and so on. And uh, so we can ask each other certain things. And, uh, and it's not like crossing some sort of line. If, if, I, if I'm standing up here, like my job right now is stand here and speak. If I needed a bottle of water and didn't have one, I'd ask one of them. They wouldn't feel imposed upon. But if I asked a total stranger, it'd be like, who is this guy who needs me to go run this errand for him, right? You know? You have a reciprocal relationship with the people that you're close to in your life that is efficient, and also if you do cross the line, they'll tell you. Why am I always the one who has to get you water? You could have thought of getting your own water before you came in the room, and perhaps next time you will. Then that's good information, and you sit there and you think about it, you see. And so there's a give and take to it. Well, it's the same thing in working with spirit. It's not because spirit is at all reluctant. It is not at all reluctant. But we within ourselves feel like, who am I anyway to be asking this sort of thing? And that's the belief that we hand off to its law, to the subconscious nature of the thing. Like when we say, I'm going to pray now, and this probably won't work. This probably will go nowhere. But I heard a talk this morning where they said to pray, and so I'm going to give it a... Okay, so what are you handing off to the subconscious mind? A, a very mixed bag, right? About a 60-40 split or something along the lines of whether this is going to go anywhere or not. So you want to soften up the subconscious mind by regular spiritual practice through meditation where you're not asking for anything. You're just being in communion with the infinite which the guy was doing who went to the spiritual leader who said God loves you just the way you are. When he heard that from, you, you'll recall from his grandfather when he was very little, when his grandfather said about God, he said God is everywhere, you just gotta look. You just gotta look. And so we spend a significant time in our spiritual practice just looking before we start asking, before we even start claiming certain specific outcomes. See, it all starts within. When I accept myself the way I am, this is rudimentary. When I accept myself the way I am, I accept you the way you are. Or at least I don't judge you. I don't care how you are. I don't even notice how you are. In fact, it's nice sometimes to not have to notice. I'm not saying you have to single everybody out and decide how they are and then gush with unconditional love toward them, because that's kind of creepy and intrusive, right? <laughs> Instead, people can pass by your field of vision and, and you're not engaged with them until you are. Leave them alone, you know? They're having their... So I was working on an example for this through reading in the news this week and articles and all the stuff that... And on the way here, this guy ran across the street in front of me. I was driving on Spring Studner. And this guy ran across, not close by, not like where I had to screech and not hit him, you know, but he was up ahead. But I saw him clearly, and I saw him coming, because I'm an attentive driver, you know. And, uh, and he came out of this subdivision, and he ran across the road, and the, across the esplanade, you know, to the other side, and then ran down this way. And why I bring this up is because the look on his face was very scary. He looked like he was being chased. He looked like he was in terror. He was not jogging, he was running. He was running full out. Part of me wanted to turn the car around and go find this guy and see what I could do to help, but I did for several reasons. One was I was due here. I have a commitment to you, okay? 
Another reason was I had no idea what was going on with him, and it could have completely freaked him out. Here comes this car after him, and it just added to his stress level. Okay. And maybe I misread the whole situation, and that's how he looks when he runs. <laughs> and he likes to run in the morning, and he likes to run through traffic, kind of, you know? I don't know. But what I got to manage in that experience, like is what we get to manage in our own experience, is me. My reactions, my response. And so I didn't turn the car around and I didn't call the police and I didn't cause a fuss and I didn't do all this. What I did do was bless him. That's not a term I'd normally use, but to, to express it to you so you get what I mean. I blessed him. I blessed him whatever was going on with him because he caught my eye. Most of the time when I'm driving or doing anything else, I'm not busy blessing all the other drivers. I got rock and roll on or I'm thinking about my talk or something like that. But in this case where this man caught my eye, literally crossed my field of vision, I blessed him. I sent a blessing after him. And you know what I think? I think that matters. I think that's effective. I think a blessing like that does some good. Whether it would pull this guy out of whatever difficulty he's in, if in fact he is in any difficulty, I have no way of knowing. And it would be presumptuous and arrogant of me to think that my blessing was this, you know, life thing, preserver thing thrown to him that is going to, right? But I felt better. I felt like I did something useful. And that's pride in a healthy way. See, we've been taught to not be proud. We've been taught, give it all away. We've had a Hebrew Testament line shoved down our throats for a long time about, it is more blessed to give than to receive, right? <laughs> in the booming voice, which is completely illogical because if you think about it, if you're giving, then somebody's receiving. And so your act of giving, noble as it is, is putting them in a position of less blessedness. Right? <laughs> here, have this. And now they're, oh no, now I'm receiving. And so they, here, they have to offload. And it's this hot potato, see, that has to get passed on. Because, oh, I want to be. They're either part of the same circuit or, or or the whole thing falls apart. Everyone, whole economies are built on giving and receiving. Of exchange. Life is blessed as we express, okay? But my part of the experience is to decide where I stand in it today. And if I'm proud of myself, if I enjoy how I am, if I take possession of my own faculties, I'm doing the best that I possibly can. And if I'm proud of somebody else and I express that in a way that's not dismissive and all of this, and I'm thinking about Reverend Lisa here because we, around her ordination, I said to her, I'm really proud, I think I said I'm proud of you. And if I didn't, I am and I should have. And I heard other people say that. And then, but I kind of, I kind of reeled it back in a little bit because I thought that sounds downhill. You know what I mean? That sounds like I, from this vantage point of great experience and wisdom and proud of you, grasshopper, for having, you know, it's like, whoa, you surprised me. You, you did something good. That's kind of how it rings in the air. You, was, you, you, you accomplished this thing. And what I meant, by the way, as Danielle was speaking of, the time and energy it takes to go to become a practitioner. What I meant to mention on the night of your ordination, it's taken me a month to do it, is I had somebody walk in here one time, more than once, but once that I remember, and say, I like this. This is a great teaching. I'd like to be a minister. How do I do that? And how long will it take? And I said, have you had any classes? So, no, no, I'm brand new here. And I assume you want to be an ordained minister. I said, yeah, yeah. I said, 10 years. And that's 
if you go at it nonstop and you don't take a summer off, 10 years. 10 years is what you put in. 10 years is what we put in. And whoever was asking me that suddenly got interested in a different career path. <laughs> Because 10 years is college plus medical school plus the better part of a residency to get to where you are. So anyway, the matter of, of saying I'm proud of you, I'm proud of people, there may be a better way to language it. The fact of the matter is if everybody just knew they were all right, this has been our summer assignment and it continues because summer continues. Good Lord, does summer continue. It may rain this week. But our assignment continues to know who we are, to treat to know, to meditate to know, to commune with the infinite to know who we are, and to do the same for others to know who they are. Because I absolutely believe that when other people know who they are, they'll leave each other alone. Except for love, except for compassion, except for occasionally turning the car around to go see how they can help. Because had this guy's hair been on fire or something, I would have been late today. You know what I mean? Had I known for sure that there was something that needed to be intervened with, I would have been the one to intervene in it. Why? Because I saw it. Because I was there. So it was my job to do. This is how, it, this is how life works. It, it gives us, on some level, what we're prepared to manage, prepared to interface with. But when people know who they are, they'll stop looking at each other and judging each other about how they love and who they love and, and all of this, this craziness will, will stop and people will so, just celebrate how great it is to see love. As I've often said, if you, if you see a couple, you see a couple of people and they're, walk, they're holding hands and they're, they're being affectionate and, and you go, ooh, look at that, romance. What that's telling you is, you're lonely, right? You're, you're envious. Whereas it's like, oh, look at that. Look at those two. They, they seem to be so in love. They seem to be so affectionate. That's telling you, you're in a, you're in a well-adjusted place yourself. It's not about making you wrong. It's about incoming information, how the world, how the world impacts you and your feeling about yourself. So I wish for us all peace. I wish for us all comfort. My talk next week, I know it's the 4th of July and rah-rah and sis boom ba and all that, but my talk is going to be on rest, on the <laughs> spiritual value of rest because it's a three-day weekend and you can chill and you can chill, okay? So to prepare for that now, allow yourself to go on a spiritual vacation, to turn within and say, I'm going to take a vacation from my responsibility to judge all of creation. I'm going to leave that to something else and actually nothing else. If you leave it, nothing else will pick it up. Because God doesn't judge. The source of all creation just flows through its own manifestations. Or as Michael Bernard Beckwith puts it beautifully, he calls us emanations emanations, right? Isn't that nice? We're emanations, like the sun beating down. We're emanations of spirit. No judgment, no judgment, a judgment-free zone. So I wish you a happy Pride weekend, a happy Pride month. I wish all our LGBTQ plus brothers and sisters and non-binary individuals, I wish you love. I wish you peace. I wish you prosperity. And I wish you a world that works for you and all of us in it with you because we are one human family. Let's let, know together there is one life, one power, one presence. And we are softening it up now by going into communion with it. And I speak this word into it on behalf of us all. In a knowing perfect right action is occurring through each one of us, through our culture, through our society, that all things are working together for good no matter how any aspect of it may appear.
For human nature and divine nature share one nature, being and becoming. Being and becoming. The becoming aspect of being in my life is what I manage by my selection of thoughts and my empowerment of those thoughts with emotion. And as I'm doing this, so is the next person and the person after them. And so are all of us together. And together we're creating the collective consciousness of the species and of the planet. And a lot of the results of this occur outside of our awareness. And that does not mean they are not occurring. So much happens in the silence. So much happens in the darkness, the stillness, in the depth of the human soul. I affirm and know comfort and peace and justice perfect good for all and in this knowing I am so deeply grateful to this one life that has brought us all together as a community here actual and virtual to be in love with each other and model love for this world I release this word now into that one life that I think of as the source of all creation. And I let it be, and so it is. So it is. When Jesse was speaking, I thought of this, well, I guess anecdote story that I want to share with everybody. So I had the pleasure of having Reverend Marsha Lehman be my practitioner one and practitioner two teacher. Um, he was saying it takes like 10 years to become a minister. Well, four or five of those years is you trying to become a practitioner, just so everybody knows. Lots of classes, lots of information, lots of stuff. One of the things that I heard Reverend Marsha saying in the back of my mind as Jesse was talking is she always told us, because as practitioner, practitioners, we innately want to do. We just instinctly want to do. And so one of the things that she made us do is question ourselves and ask spirit, is this mine to do? And one of the main reasons why is because if you're doing everything, it does not give other people the opportunity to do anything. So because of that, asking the question, what is mine to do? Is this mine to do? And I want to thank each and every one of you for being here because with you being here, this was yours to do. For you to come and give us your love, give us your energy, give us your spirit. That is yours to do. It is also yours to do to help support this center, not only with your presence and with your love and your energy, but also your financial support. And as our ushers make their way to the back, I want to thank each and every one of you for what you give to this center. Your financial support, your energy, your presence, everything you do here, everything you give here, it is valued, it is appreciated. We are internally grateful and we try to honor your gifts to the best of our ability by giving you the best of us. And so with that, I invite you now to say with me, divine love through me blesses and multiplies all the good I am and have, all the good I give and receive. I am prosperous now, and so it is. We, we start training them young. <laughs> but that's one of the things that we say in our kids program. Um, you know, t how would you feel if you had started learning this stuff at their age? which is an excellent reason to participate in our kids program when we get that started back up. Um, and then, yeah, there are multiple other things. But one of the things I will say is when people tell me that they're proud of me, I, I endeavor to be a good receiver and say thank you. Um, and so that when somebody offers you a compliment, 
the best thing you can do is receive it and say thank you. Because uh, that journey into ministry, I, st I showed up here in 2005 and I got ordained a month ago. So that should tell you something. Now, I mean, it took me a while to start taking classes. And then I was a practitioner for a little while before all of a sudden I got the, the, the spiritual two by four <laughs> that sent me screaming into ministerial school. And then I was stubborn, you know, I could have completed the, the, the school in four years. I could have completed the internship in four or three years. And I didn't, I took four in both of them. So, you know, to each their own. But there is a meme that I posted on Facebook and I'm gonna bring it to your attention. Until you get very clear on what you want, you will get something that sort of kind of almost but not quite meets it. Keep refining with each experience. It creates clarity. Okay, so that's up there for you. Feel free to, well, I like to screenshot them and keep them so I can refer back to them. Um, and as I enter into uh, our closing treatment to send you out into the world, I want you to know that we stand with you. Be you LGBTQ, be you a woman, be you anything else that has hit you recently, we stand with you. We are processing ourselves, which is why we are being careful about what we say, because we are afraid that we will foam at the mouth. And we wanna have a considered response, not a crazy reaction. So just know we stand with you. And in that knowing, know that there is one life, one power, one presence, one love. And each and every one of us are a part of that love. We are channels for that love into this world. It is through us that unconditional love enters into the world. It is through us that amazing things happen in love. And so I invite you now to open up to that power, open up to that presence, open up to that life, open up to that love. Open up to that pride of knowing that you are a beloved child of God and that every face that you meet is also a beloved child of God. Open up to that experience and share it. Share it. Greet every living thing as a beloved child of God. Greet every day with love. Greet every experience with love. Greet every decision with love and I promise you cannot go wrong and so I know this love I know this power I know this presence I know this love and I know it with all of the gratitude in my being so as we step forth out into this world we do so in love we carry the love with us we share the love we are the love. And I relax, release, and know that it is so even as I speak these words, and so it is. And so it is. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Say with me now, something wonderful is happening through me. Something wonderful is happening through me. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in everything I am. I feel it in everything I am. I choose it. I choose it. I trust it. I trust it. I use it. I use it. And I love it. And I love it. And so it is. And so it is.